a very, very warm welcome to our speaker for this evening, Kirtida Unwala. I'm so happy that you agreed to give this talk. You had addressed us several years ago on the Matharan project, which was really path breaking at that time. And I'm sure you'll be talking about that project to us this evening. So on behalf of the chairman and trustees of the CSMVS and the director general, Mr. Sabia Sachi Mukherjee, it gives me great pride and joy on behalf of the Museum Society of Bombay and my very, very supportive executive committee to welcome everybody here this evening on what is going to be, I believe, a very, very important and interesting talk by Kirtida Unwala on heritage conservation, a tenet to sustainable development. In Kirtida's words, she says, do as much as necessary and as little as possible are the doctrines enshrined in the actions prescribed in the regimes of cultural heritage conservation. The key word is sustainability in its underlying principles in consonance echo the maxim of the prescribed doctrines in the essential mission of transmitting what is of value from the past and present to future custodians. This is all that we are trying to do for the last several decades, at least in Mumbai city and in many other parts of India and indeed in other parts of the world. Cultural heritage conservation would be endowed thus to qualify as a tenet to sustainable development. In the context of heritage conservation, the dual aspects of continuity and change are inherent manifestations and play a vital role in influencing decision-making and imply a justifiable approach with an objective accountability. I think accountability is one more key word that we have to keep in mind in the environment that we are battling today. The assessment of cultural value using an informed and scientific process plays a significant role in decision-making processes and promotion of informed conservation action. This presentation today is a journey of her experiences as applied to a varied context of cultural heritage, what Kirtida terms as our assets a discourse of understanding the complex dynamics that shroud the decision-making processes of conservation actions. I know we have a lot of people here from Mumbai city, but we do have others who have joined us from other parts of India. And I welcome those, all of my friends and all of those who come from other organizations who are here with us today. And as Jason will tell you at the end, and so will Anita, that very gradually we're putting all our lectures on YouTube, and so will this one be on YouTube. So just a few words, if you'll indulge me, on Kirtida Unwala, a practicing architect since more than three decades, who received the coveted Charles Wallace Fellowship from the UK in 1996, based on her heightened interests in conservation of the built environment. Her practice thus took up conservation as mainstream and spans over two decades and more in collaboration with multi-directional focus. Restoration projects on individual assets to management of the wider environment. She has collaborated with INTAC and with MMR HCS she has served on the Heritage Committee and has done path-breaking undertaking for the conservation of the Mathiran Hill Station and Monitoring Committee, Mathiran Eco-Sensitive Zone, the Satara Regional Planning Board, Mumbai Heritage Review Committee, and she's currently on the Mumbai Urban Heritage Conservation Committee. Kirti Da has maintained her teaching assignments all through these last three decades and is currently a visiting professor at Kamla Raheja Vidyanidhi Institute for the master's program in urban conservation and at the Indian in Education Society College for architecture and design dissertation for a undergraduate, pro undergraduate process via thesis. 
So Kirtida, we are indeed really honored to have you in our midst. And we're all looking forward to all the projects that you have been doing in and around India. So I hand you over now to the technical team who will now put you on full screen to start the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy what is going to be a really eye-opening event for many of us here today. Thank you so much for joining us. So greetings to everyone who has joined this talk and I hope I'm able to justify what has just been said by my good friend, Firoza Godrej. Um, it's very nice to talk to people at large uh, on, the, on the aspects of conservations, especially because it is a field which really needs a huge amount of awareness and getting tuned into. So it is a great pleasure to connect with more people, people besides my students, of course. So I'm very happy to be here and I thank very much Firoza Godrej to invite me on this session. Thank you very much to the Chhatrapati Shivaji Vastu Sankralaya and the Museum Society of Mumbai. I'm very happy to be here and I hope that you enjoy the journey that I have undertaken for the last uh, more than three decades. I'm just trying to share it with everybody so that it gets into the general arena and the understanding for conservation actions becomes a more informed uh, uh, decisions and situations for everybody to understand. Thank you very much. Nice to be talking to you. So the first slide obviously is about the title which Piroza has amply spoken about. I call heritage conservation as a tenet to sustainable development for a reason. And the reason is simply that if one understands that the environment is the setting for the built forms, and if, if conservation has to be done within that setting, then one has to understand that conservation in its meaning, it basically says to keep entire, to retain, to preserve, which means that the feature for change is, very, is going to be very limited. So then how does conservation take up its processes in a place or a setting that is significant in its values and yet is asking for a change? So what one does is to, is to understand a system or understand a process of how to gauge the value for for, for conservation and value of a particular asset or a group of assets. In what we term as an informed decision-making, in that informed decision-making, there's a term that we use very, very largely and very significantly. And as conservation uh, practitioners, we keep reminding ourselves each time for this term or about this term it is called cultural significance and evaluation of cultural significance. What, what is cultural significance all about? It only means that it encapsulates the various values that are part and parcel of the historic values, which are part and parcel of the process that guides us professionals and others. So these are imbibed in, in various uh, regimes and it can be surrounded in, in the aesthetics value, in the historic value, in the scientific value or the social value and definitely for the past, present and the future generations. And therefore I would say that change thus is inherent to such significances. So all these are associational values of cultural significance which are associated to a place. And therefore I'm highlighting here, and I'm sorry for writing the text here. I think eventually I'm a teacher somewhere down in my heart and therefore I do try and tend to get into the educational regime. So that is why some of this text appears initially. You may ignore it eventually, but uh, I, I'm stressing it here only because I have put it here so that it makes its mark 
into this understanding of cultural significance. And therefore, I would say that the literal meaning of the term conservation would be to keep entire, and then it would then acquire a different connotation, that of maintaining cultural identity. And therefore, for all of us practitioners, it becomes important to understand this value so that while carrying out conservation actions, we do not go wrong and we have the prescription of the cultural significance always in our minds as a statement of cultural significance. So how does one assess uh, cultural significance? And there's a very scientific method of doing it. It has been imbibed for years, various decades globally by bodies like ICOMOS under the aegis of UNESCO. So globally, there has been an understanding which has been converted into an informed system. And that informed system is what we take as a guidance. When I started my journey, it was this system that I undertook and valued so much. I almost literally took it as a textbook guidance. And so emotional values, cultural values, use values, all these have to be analyzed. In fact, in Mumbai, we all know that we have a heritage list and the heritage list will have a list card for every asset which has been identified within the heritage list. If you really want to look closely into this aspect of the list card, then the list card actually imbibes, actually carries these values within the list card. This aspect may be new to some of you who are not in the knowledge of what is a list card and how are heritage values understood and imbibed within a larger arena for people to observe, see, and go by. So all these values, emotional, cultural, and use values become a part and parcel of the listing which is done. And it is actually ingrained uh, in, in a physical form into the list card. All of you may choose to now go into the list cards whenever you get a chance, because the list cards are, are all available on the, on the uh, channels under MMR HCS. And they are always available as an open arena. So one can go into this to understand how these values are imbibed into the list card and also into the uh, heritage regulations, which come up in, in the pink book, as we call it. It's the 1995 regulations pink book, which, which imbibes these values in the last few pages. Its connotations and its demarcations may appear different, but they are actually looking at these values. So value assessment is something that all of us begin with. It may be any asset of any size and scope. It may be a wider context. It may be an individual asset, like a singular building, or a larger assets of precincts going on to towns and villages and going on to entire cities. The establishment of cultural significance is the prime beginning for any action that has to be taken. This gives us a provides us a sound base for conservation. And therefore it takes us on to the ideologies of repair and restorations. All of us, all practitioners undergo this system and they, they do it very rigorously. And that is why they're able to answer any question that is raised about a decision taken for the actions of conservation for the asset in which they are practicing. Preventive maintenance of historic buildings is a central focus for all of us to understand. People often grumble that conservation is an expensive action taking. It is very expensive and that 
most of the people will always uh, kind of share their grave uh, concern about not affording to do conservation. It is only because this idiom that our grandmothers have always passed on to us, a stitch in time saves nine. It is only because of the, the, the large environment of other overlapping aspects that shroud the, the asset, uh, the asset which is culturally very significant. It may be the regime of uh, ownership patterns. It may be uh, in the form of other DCR or development control regulations, which are overlapping onto the aspect of protecting uh, or conserving an asset. So there is a term which is used in conservation, which says that preventive maintenance it should be a part of the planned strategic program. All the uh, works that we undertake under the regime of protection and conservation, at the end of the day, we give the client, which is a, a, a done thing, we give the client a, a, a program which tells them of how to maintain it periodically. Because once we are gone, beyond that project, the client or the owner must know how to and when to, and what should be the process of maintaining the building in a way that this proverb, a stitch in time saves nine, becomes active. And so I would start with my journey and I would start in an order where I would look at the larger areas in, in which my practice has been uh, involved with. I would not like to say my, uh, if I say it by mistake, I would like to uh, pronounce it right at the onset that the conservation actions and conservation profession is not singularly by an architect or by a single practitioner. I'm very indebted to my entire team for these last 30 years who has been a part and parcel of making this journey a success. To all the craftsmen, to all my colleagues, to all the various uh, team that has worked in my office and outside my office, quite a few of them have joined today. And I really want to thank everyone. So it must be understood that conservation is not a part and parcel or cannot encompass a singular person or a profession, it professional. It has to be considered as a very, very collaborative process. And this becomes an ethic of conservation. In fact, it is written down in all ethical records that it is a, rather a game which is collaborative. So each time that a project is discussed, in this, uh, in this uh, talk, it has to be understood that it is a collaborative process. So Matheran is something that is very close to our heart. The wider context of Matheran is a hill station. The very history of Matheran or any hill station in the country is very, very, very complex to understand. It has a huge historical background. I will not go into the details of history because I'm going to cover my journey very fast. But it has to be understood that as a hill station, it is set up, its setting essentially is environmental setting. It is a, it is a forest. 75% of this area is a forest even today. It is the only hill station in Asia which is proclaimed by a notification to be a, a hill station which has to be traveled on foot. It is a pedestrian hill station, the only one in the, in the context of Asia. So one can understand the cultural significance immediately. And therefore we coined the term, the term was coined of sustainable development. And this was actually a project by MMRHCS, and they, with their foresight and their far sight, actually 
insisted that it should become an enabling environment so that it sustains a healthy station and stands by the tenets that it has, which are emb embodied within itself. And so evaluation of cultural significance becomes a part and parcel of the regime even here. And our first job actually was to identify cultural significance and thereby identify the listed assets. And so what we did was, or rather what was done was to understand Mataran at a larger component level environment. And how does one do that? And so it was decided amongst uh, our team that we should understand it in its entirety. Its entirety can only come from the three terms that I'm using here in this uh, tree that I'm showing, diagram T, tree. One has to understand the built environment, the natural and the built and the natural as a cohesive environment because all environments are always, uh, always take birth because of human uh, intervention and therefore the cohesive environment is something that has to be looked into. So, and this took us into the different aspects which need control based on this diagram. And the control regimes would then, then be uh, encompassed by conservation areas, townscape detail and planting, man-made features, and there'll be list cards for each of these. And one cannot forget the Mataran Railway here because it is a Mataran Railway which has connected the place and made it famous and available, accessible to one and all. So Mataran Railway features here and we call the title as Mataran Comprehensive Heritage Listing Proposal. And as a summary of the total grading out of the total 420 plots with built forms only, 195 plots are listed forming 46.43% of the total plots. Now this may appear as apparently a high uh, figure comparatively in the percentage, but then the ecological concerns of the place will definitely justify this extent of listing. And one can see how rich the built environment is by the simple glance at uh, the built forms. The list cards I'm showing it purposely here with a specific intent uh, because I would like all of you to go into the web page of MMRHCS and go through this because this actually forms the arena or the regime in which practitioners and even control systems like administrators can look into this. The last component here, and I'm enlarging it here, it covers so many aspects of uh, each of the assets and one can just take a glimpse one doesn't need to go through the entire report of so many hundreds of pages. It just comes up alive here. And the last remarks are actually for conservation and development. And this is the remarks that the Heritage Committee will look at immediately. And this will tell them as to what should be the, the uh, proposal aimed at. So list cards become important components in our country and in Mumbai, very, very well encompassed by MMR HCS in their webpage. In the Western countries, most of the list cards are available in the public libraries for everybody to access. So Mataram Railway stays on the tentative World Heritage list currently, together with the Darjeeling, Nilgiri and Kalka Shimla Railway. It was established by an Indian gentleman. The endeavor was completely his. One cannot forget Abdul Hussein Adamji Pirboy, who also set up the railway. And he urged the government because of his great uh, enterprise within the station to lend him certain plots, almost 100 plots, so that he could develop these plots, not only for the rich and the famous, but also for people who come from different social status. And, and that was a huge thing that he did. 
Eventually, the Heritage Committee was set up, the Monitoring Committee was set up, and uh, we have been very fortunate right since the inception to have been connected to these committees so that our experience passes on to these. And therefore, we guided the other components which were missing in the control and to provide a sustainable approach as an overall approach. And we guided them to, to appoint, a, appoint and, and provide a tourism master plan for Mataran eco-sensitive zone because the entire 100% economy of Mataran depends on tourism. And therefore it has to be, it has to have a focus on tourism. We also had the, the monitoring committee also guided the government to provide Mataran with a environment conservation plan. This conservation plan is in, in such details that it is amazing to, to see such approach in detail. I would urge whoever is interested to go through this. It is available either with me or with MMRHCS or even with the Mataran Heritage Committee. We went on to have a street furniture manual as a component of the environment uh, management plan because all the street furniture that is required in this in a place like this has to be controlled by special design. And so the street furniture manual covered that aspect. Coming home, the Kambala Hill precinct was something that we undertook as a team through my practice and with a huge amount of uh, enterprise and help and assistance from the MMR Heritage Conservation Society. This is quite at home. Uh, the Kambala Hill precinct, as it is called, it was identified in the 1991 heritage list and the prescriptions of the, uh, of the 1991 regulations. But it took some time to understand its significance and, and come up with a proper plan. And the proper plan would involve listing. If, it, if the assets are not listed and identified and, and given a background to, to provide a certain control as much as required, then it does not become effective. And this is something that I call a sustainable. If an asset has to be made sustainable, it has to have a management plan from various aspects totally in place. So Kambala Hill was studied in detail. It's a very, very urban area. It has overgrown and has a chronological past. It has a chronological history, which was understood by us and listing was done just like listing was done to for Mataran Hill Station. If one has to look at the methodology, it is just like in the case of Mataran, I would say that designation of the area as a precinct is the first thing that needs to be done. So it's exact boundary, the scope of the boundary has to be identified. And that is what I mean by designation. The next would be general planning control as it is applied from within the arena of the development control regulations as prescribed by our development plan. And it has to fit into that box like a glove. And if it does not fit like that, then the guidelines go defunct. And therefore what we, what we try to do is to put it into the very context in the technical terms that the DCR uses. And therefore we are using the same terms here demolition and reconstruction, listed and unlisted building control, conservation of special character of sub precincts, urban form, architectural control guidelines, alterations and infill designs, and environmental improve, improvements. And then we went on to identify the number of listed buildings and the figures appear here. There are listed sub precincts, two of them. 
So there's a larger precinct of Kamala Hill within which there are smaller sub precincts as a part and parcel of the larger precinct because it behaves cohesively. And then one can also identify a group of buildings which behave as a, as a, as a cohesive group. And so we identified group values as well here. The rich heritage of uh, Mumbai, the Art Deco heritage of Mumbai, I would say that, and I, I, with a great authority, I would say that the Art Deco character of the buildings here, that is in this precinct is one of, not one of the, I would say it is the richest in its characteristics. And all this appears in the list cards. And they were graded like grade 2A, 2B, and 3, and so on, and within also the heritage precincts. What you can see is how much work that is required to do this simple listing. So the list cards in the listing appears in a very simplistic manner in the DCR, in the book, which proclaims the control. But the amount of work that is required is immense. And therefore the list card and its connotations have not are not to be taken at a face value. There's a lot of assessment that has happened to identify the cultural significance and, and thereby each value, each of the values that I spoke about in the initial uh, uh, talk, initial part of my talk with you. So I would continue to show you some more pictures, some very rich heritage. The government bungalows on this, uh, on this hill, once again, somehow I, I have an affinity for hills maybe, because I started with looking at Mataran Hill Station and then uh, fortunately I came up with the Kamala Hill, which is also a hill. Anybody who's interested in looking up the context of history of the chronological yeah. development of this hill station from the understandings of ownership patterns and why did it grow up and why did it die? why does it have an urban structure that it has it's a very interesting history and the grading and the identification of cultural significance is uh, in 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 uh, syncrasy with such chronological development so one has to understand that all the gradings that is happening here is quite synonymous with this identification of cultural significance. You can see the rich history, not only, sorry, the rich Art Deco characteristics, not only externally, but internally as well. So many of these government bungalows, Rylestone, belongs to the Ministry of Petroleum and Coal. I don't, I'm not too sure as to which ministry it belongs to today. But when we were doing our listing and visiting these sites, they were the ones, they and the embassies, the various foreign embassies, which are located in this area and occupying very significant buildings, they extended our entry with open hands and therefore we were able to list it and identify the significance so correctly. So some more pictures of the details of one more proposed uh, sub-precinct, the Ragavji Mark sub-precinct, which normally is taken as a very nominal uh, uh, architectural character. But if one really looks at it, the way it is set up in that inclined terrain, the way it is set and still respects the Art Deco uh, proclamation of that era and the age, and therefore the architects of that time. One should not forget the architects, uh, each architect that has played a role in uh, giving us this richness in, of Art Deco in the city housing typologies differ, but the lending of Art Deco is far and wide in this precinct. Very interesting precincts, very 
interesting connectivities uh, with the structure of the areas within and outside the scope of the boundary. And what we have, uh, what we realized that although, although these uh, characteristics seem very nominal and very dense in character, even within it, one can identify the richness of its landscape character. And that is what we went on to identify, analyze, and make a proposal. So that a controlled, a controlled environment can be prescribed before anybody attempts making change to the smallest of the components with, in the landscape character. Some drawings of uh, the characteristics of the architecture. I would not claim to have rastered this uh, in the sense they are not documented as, as, as uh, in detail as you see here, but we took a shortcut to raster them, go over them and make this drawing from the pictures that we took because one doesn't always have as much time at, at our, uh, at, at, at given to us to complete the project. The next is Elephant Island Conservation Management Plan. It's a World Heritage Site. Uh, Mumbai is very proud of three World Heritage Sites within our context. And I don't want to go on to a cribbing story, but we all understand that most of these are languishing. UNESCO makes it compulsory that the government has an active role as a stakeholder in the very proclaiming and very notification of these world heritage sites. But we do have stories where we know for sure that it has not been fulfilled to the fullest. Who to blame is not an area to discuss today, but I would nonetheless want to make it, a, make it a point that there are a huge amount of lacunas at many levels. And that is the same thing that happens at Elephanta Caves. I have a huge tribute to play to pay to intact Mumbai chapter, Mrs. Tasni Mehta, who pioneered this and considered us worthy of undertaking this. It was at that point of time, quite a scary proposal for me because it, for me and my team as well, I, I did have on my team, my colleague, Sunita Samant, uh, who's a part of this uh, 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 listening to us just now. And to understand it from the planning perspective and from the urban structure perspective. And that is why we decided to do it jointly with uh, Tasneem Mehta. And, and therefore this report that was produced cannot be, as I said, a completely uh, responsibility or even uh, a proclamation or proposal making from our side. I would like to make this quite visible that it was with INTAC Mumbai chapter and with MMR HCS that this was, this happened. It was a very detailed process of identifying the main archeological features and what was happening to these archeological features. Because this, this island has three indigenous villages which have been staying there uh, from, from their ancestry. In fact, from the very onset of the inhabitation of this island. We all know, or if we don't know, we can look into the history of the connectivity of this island as the island, not as a part of the seven islands of which Mumbai is composed of, but a separate island, it has a very rich history. And so we went on to identify the planning strategy here. Out of the planning strategy, uh, it became very obvious that if it is a world heritage site and if it has to have a visitor accessibility and an educative understanding, educated understanding of the site, then one needs a museum. And this was the first aspect that was taken up and this was restored by INTAC and uh, because the library was undertook the restoration of this 
custodian cottage, which was converted into. And therefore we identified as a close preview, World Heritage Site zones with proper boundaries according uh, within the control mechanisms offered by ASI, because ASI is a controlling body here. And so we identified these as a special site zones so that control can be uh, provided to this in a more easier manner and they can be prescribed and notified accordingly. And therefore action plans were provided under different headings. Like in this case, it was a visitor management plan. The journey that a visitor takes on this entire island. As we all know, every visitor goes only for a few hours and has to come back. And that is something which we found as an issue. And we identified if a visitor can go to all the sites and if the ferry service can cater to that and so on. And so the action area has also looked at the landscape management plan again being an island which is surrounded by the sea and therefore it has its environmental factors which are inherent as a character uh, with the island. There were many proposals. I'm only showcasing a few here. There was a huge uh, a hue and cry by the visitors that they have to travel this jetty in the hot sun and therefore a kind of uh, design was provided which was in sync with the character of the villages at, in the, which are visible in the background and so, and so on. So all this was done. The, one of, the next project here is that I, we are going to discuss is a very distinct project, very unique. Uh, MMR HCS has covered a huge ground and it has taken up upon itself to at least carry out all the identified, uh, not identified, but the entire MMR region for heritage listing. And it did that under, under different jurisdictions. One of them was the Agashi Talao precinct. Basically, it was the Vasai Virar VVSR, VVSR at this call, which is now a special uh, uh, administration and a corporation on its own. And uh, a, a basic plan for identification of assets were done by a body called CRIT. It's a group of people who are urban designers and uh, urban planners and conservation architects who identified the heritage list and heritage precincts. Uh, MMR HCS thought that this should continue and it should not end in just the listing process and it becoming a part and parcel of the DCR and the DP. It's, it, it, they, the governor body th thought that it should go ahead and look at action area plans. So that stakeholding patterns come alive. In, all the change that can happen in, in a precinct like this can be guided by the stakeholders, people who live in this precinct, people who are connected socially and philosophically and economically to this precinct. And therefore this was taken up. So I'm only going to showcase by two, three sheets as to what is a location what is the history of Vasai Virar? Historians in this panel, in this uh, group, will surely understand what is the significance of Vasai Virar region historically to the seven islands of Mumbai and so on. So it has a very rich history. And so one prepares again the same sequence of understanding the cultural significance that must have been undertaken by this team, CRIT, the body, uh, which identified this as a precinct. And we, at our level, we simply evaluated this once again so that we can give a fresh and a proposal to the precinct. So this was the exercise undertaken, a very small precinct, a simple, a single street that is a temple precinct street and uh, therefore, in Marathi, colloquially, it is called Devari. And there are very significant temples here with a built tank 
And the, the main temple is a Shiva temple, a very old temple of 16th to 17th century. And there are other temples. So this entire street is lined up by four or five temples. And what we did was, and, and what Crit had identified was about an environmental assets of the area. So this area has thrives still in the agrarian economy, even today. And it has identified at least listed at least 80 environmental assets. Most of them are lakes and water bodies. So one would be amazed that an area which is today a corporation has this list of natural assets and therefore they need control. And that is one of the, one of the thoughts that, had, that is imbibed in my initial title of conservation being a tenet to sustainability. One has to look beyond the built form that one is dealing with. One has to look at its larger setting and its environmental status uh, overall. So it is very important that it is looked at from this wider, wider context. So these are the various drawings. We, it was also identified with a scientific basis for how to protect the water body in detail. And I come again to the stitch in time phenomenon that I expressed earlier. I call it a phenomenon because it really is a phenomenon. If one would have taken care of their assets in a prescribed manner with an attachment with the asset, then it would not have gone into the state of disrepair that it would, that most of us find it in. And I wish sincerely that once these projects are over and done with, the management regime prescribed by the practitioner is followed. So I'm presenting this with two projects. I'll quickly go through it. One of them is in the setting of the Mataran Hill Station and one is our very own, very dear Bikaberam well at the fort areas. And so preventive maintenance is a technical term which is used by the ideology and the informed systems proclaimed globally in the text of the global understanding. So preventive maintenance is a technical term. Bar house, in my experience, uh, in our experience, when we were doing the listing was not used for 40 years. Bikaberam well is in a continuous use, but because of its ownership pattern and economical base, it was not looked at for maintenance and upkeep. And so the work of a conservation architect is something that needs to be understood in this uh, uh, in the stitch in time saves nine. Even we have to understand how to analyze this. So that is what I am proclaiming here. A strategic maintenance plan with minimum intervention is required. The stages of the report will go into this different stages, initial maintenance plan, research and analysis, cultural significance identification, and so on. And if one looks at Bar House, the veranda in the forest, it was, as I said, since 40 years, it had not been in use. As I said, Matharan is uh, an area which is only on foot and therefore it becomes, it became out of kind of fashion and people stopped coming to Mataran. In fact, immediately after the British left because it was no more fashionable to showcase themselves. Uh, that is what is said in the historic text. And it is true that the chronological order of disrepair of the hill station and its assets coincide with the uh, independence of the country. And therefore, one of the assets, which is Bar House, 
uh, went into the same status of disrepair. Very fortunate that it was again, uh, I was highlighted by Intact Mumbai chapter that because I've done the listing and that we should also look into this asset. It is an ownership of Nimrana Hotels. It's a very famous chain of hotels uh, who works out of heritage properties all across the country. One can Google it, Google them and find a khazana of how people convert, are able to adapt to give the property a lease of life. So the lease of life becomes important uh, in uh, conservation methodology. So very close to, in fact, the very next site adjoining Charlotte Lake, a very favored uh, setting, grade 2A. The guidelines were identified uh, by us and it was allowed to reuse as a hotel because most of these are bungalows. Uh, its footprint inherently is that of a residence and therefore very amenable to hotels. Very interesting cross sections, the bungalow typology with courtyards, very large footprint, big chronological history. So where you see the main house written, that was the only bungalow. The rest of it is all additions over a period of time. It was in a huge state of disrepair, as you can see in these pictures. Madharan is, uh, has received very heavy rain. And, and because of that, the onslaught of disrepair is very fast. The first thing we did was to use the, the methodology of using scientific processes. We were lucky to find this mortar mill at site. It was already there. So was this stone. And so we just had to get Wagya, the buffalo, and start the process. And I would say that this was one of my earliest or the first actually conservation uh, individual asset uh, for restoration. And then I had to go by the book as I said initially. I'm sorry about this overlaps of the slides. You can ignore it, please. So these are before and after pictures. I'll just run through them. It became a very interesting place. It's very famous with people who visit Mataran. It is also very good for its food now. Excellent food service here. You can see the progress and how very mundane furniture was converted and reused. All the furniture, each and every piece of the furniture was adapted and recycled and therefore sustainability. It was fashioned differently broken into components and spread about. And uh, very fortunate that the client was very, very informed about the processes of conservation. And so we had a very happy journey. So these are, and then the British, or one would say that the foreigners came back to visit. I really like this picture. In the Bikabera well. A very simple structure, very interesting history. I don't, uh, I hope I mentioned the history correctly because I had faced some issues when I was mentioning the history early on when I started the, the project. And the history is this, this is the history. The sea was up to here and the Parsi or the Zoroastrian community has, uh, within their religious context, they venerate water as one of the venerations of natural elements. And therefore, as a ritual, they started venerating this well. The well was dug by a Parsi gentleman in the date that is mentioned on the stained glass, 1725. And it had built this 
around the flower mill which existed in this area. So people who used to come to have their grain converted into flour and therefore the animals were brought in for water, what, what we call in colloquial language, havara. So this was a havara and nothing else. And the well that you see in the background was a part and parcel because it was also human beings who came here along with their animals. And so it became a kind of uh, conjoined uh, setting and a uh, built form. So that is a history. The upper form, this pedestal that you see here or the canopy that you see here is as late as 1950s. Uh, it is in concrete, excepting the columns. Everything is in concrete. Only the columns are in stone and the well is the original from it. The Havada is gone long back. When I encountered it, it was not there already. Very nice stained glass. 1950, the date came to me from the architect who was involved, Punegar Pilimoria and, uh, no, sorry, Chandaboy and Company and the architect who was involved, uh, Mr. Jamshed Aga. And the story came to me from him and therefore it is the entire truth. So the date of mentioned here is of the well and not of the canopy. Repairs were very nominal, most minimum. Drawings were made, conditions and status was understood Stained glass was restored, some more was added, and the community came back to celebrate this well. Today it has its own boundary, and uh, people, general people, are not allowed within the boundaries of this asset, and so on. This is how it was done up. We added a little bit. There was a change that came in, but it came within the context. The cycling, the cyclical maintenance program is something that I keep highlighting. The, the scientific preventive maintenance program has to be written down for every project and handed over to the client or to the owner of the place or whoever is in charge of further maintenance because it is a living asset, it is in continued use, it is continual, continuously uh, exposed to the vagaries of nature and environment, and therefore it will need a continuous maintenance program. Also, one has to understand that any program that is undertaken for conservation is not a magical wand. It cannot happen at, at once with just one program or one action. It is like an old person, uh, an old living being whose bones are broken and they are ill and they are old. And therefore it takes sometimes many continuous processes or actions to make it watertight or to make it uh, completely uh, healthy. So this was something that I put in, I found it very hard to find proper images because of a crash of my hard disk. But Firosa had made a huge request to talk about the repairs and restoration of Dadi Seid Atashveram in Fanaswadi. It's one of the oldest Atashverams in the city. And I was very fortunate to have been a part of it. Very simple structure. Our scope was simplified by this gentleman. I cannot miss him and his mention. He was instrumental in Matheran heritage listing proposal, as well as uh, assigning this great responsibility on me, even in this case, Mr. Ratan Lal Kaka. So I thought I should pay him a homage. A very simple structure, a very interesting structure. This is one of the bags as they are called with the Zoroastrian community. It has a whole setup of two pavilions and the 
Agyari or the Atashvara. The two pavilions would host functions of weddings, nauchots, and all the various other functions. They are very, very unique buildings. It, it, they would provide even housing accommodation during the stay for a short period or for a long period and therefore also gain an economic kind of a gain to maintain the property and so on. It is set up in a very, very tight native town, Panaswadi. It's such a tight urban structure. And yet this is a little oasis which is within such tight area. Our scope was restricted only to look at the Atashvara. And I, we will discuss how I, we were able to connect it with the aspect of sustainability. So this is a setup just to give you a glimpse of one enters through this canopy and there's a gate on the opposite end and the two pavilions is what you see. This is the humble structure here of the uh, Agyari, uh, Atashvara, I'm sorry. And it is just one single hall with, with uh, partitions inside to carry out the different functions and to place the Atash and so on. And it has a, a very, very dominant roof as used to be the typology of that period. And also because of the specific use uh, of placing the Atash at the bottom, which will require uh, exit to the smoke and therefore it would rise up to a chimney. So it was that kind of a structure, a very lush green setting within itself. So the roof was taken up first. Uh, it was, I think the first time that we opened it since its inception, almost 250 years. And it told its story very, very aptly. But heads off to the craftsmen who must have crafted it so sincerely in those days that it was really not much of a change, excepting a certain sagging and some of the timber members which were in, in, in a huge state of disrepair. And we had to follow the strict uh, scientific methodology to restore it, put back the tiles and so on. One of the typical issues was these uh, cast and columns which upheld the roof and the eaves of the roof. It was sandwiched between the external uh, parapet wall. And therefore it was exposed to the vagaries of time and could not be attended to because it was not exposed. And so it had completely rusted. And so we had to take a very drastic decision to cut the seats away from the column and make it exposed, treat it, and maintain it as exposed. And you can see the pictures of how it was done. And this was how it was restored. I would like you to look at this right-hand side bottom uh, picture, which at the bottom at the ground level shows a white area. This, if you keep it in your mind, and I'll continue. It was what I call, what we call technically as a French train. Most of these buildings are uh, load bearing and therefore the water creeps up their plinths and, and it creeps up to great heights and it has to be intervened. It has to be stopped without too much of a change. This uh, uh, setting, also has a well inside. It has the religious well, which is inside and at the backside of the uh, structure. Th that is not what I'm mentioning, but it has a well which is connected to the city at large. This well water that you see on the two top pictures, very interestingly, is a stream. It's a stream as a rivulet kind of, which must be going to the other areas. And there are quite a few temples in this area in the dense, dense urban fabric of Fanaswadi and beyond that the springs show up as water bodies. And I, I believe that this is a part and parcel of that. And so what we did was that we used this device, if I can call that, of the French drain is nothing but the trench. You make it hollow, you fill it up with rubble and clinker, 
till the top and you allow the water to penetrate with a slope and it is taken to a, a, a sump or a pit in which it collects and, and then travels into the general ground. So that is a device. One would say that will this not increase the uh, water uh, ingress? No, because its top surface is porous. It is left porous. It gets a chance to evaporate before it attacks the foundation and before it starts attacking or gaining ingress. It's a magnificent kind of a, in a very traditional system. It is used universally and very famously. And since then, we did not have the problem of rising dam. Naval dockyard is something that everybody will be very, very interested in. Very fortunate to again work with uh, restoration of the Bombay Castle in this case. So Bombay Castle, uh, our scope was limited, but we had to understand the asset in its entirety. And we made a very detailed report of the condition or what we call the fabric status report. And then we looked at the components which we were asked to look at. And the components were looked at with an environmental management plan. This was an advice given to the Naval Dockyard authorities that if the castle has a certain setting, the setting over a period of time has changed completely because the castle used to have the sea water coming right up to its embankments. Today, it is almost a kilometer outside. In fact, there is a huge amount of landfill and therefore to make a control zone around it so that it gets its imageability back. And so control zones were identified and I'm not claiming that this was adhered to, but it was received very well. And it was, it was mentioned to us that we'll try and do it in phases so that as one approaches the castle, it gets a visibility and an imageability which was, which it deserves so much deserves. So the control zones were identified. This, the red line that you see in the plan on the right hand side is something that we started with as phase one. Uh, can I share my cursor in any way? So the red line comes out of the bastion and it goes further. It is interesting for you all to note that this extension which I'm calling as Fort Wall E, actually is the Fort Wall. The Fort Wall, which was demolished in 1850. So this is one of the rare components which is still present. Only one of the, one of the small components which is still existing in the Bombay Castle today. The other components towards the, the north also exists, but in broken parts and most of it is below the ground, but it does exist below the ground. So this was the battlements and the area that we restored. So you can see it very clearly here, the Fort Wall E is that component which I'm mentioning as a component of the Fort Wall, the larger fort. I'm talking about the Bombay Fort, which encompassed the Bombay Castle. So technical names, curtain, bastion, fort wall. And this is what we did, scientific methodology using lime. This wall had suffered a lot. In fact, this was the wall which told us the entire history of how the wall must have grown beyond the Portuguese wall, become the British wall and how it must have grown even further to have the battlements. It told us that story by its materials in the typology of construction and so on. This was very interesting while doing that component, one of the stones fell open and we found this, what you see at the bottom, this is a kind of a tunnel or a 
crouching way up into the citadel. It would go and come into the apron of the Bombay castle, into the open areas around the castle. So we covered it up, but it has been marked and noted for posterity. The next is the component, which is again very dear to all of us, all historians, is the Angri gate and this sundial. So these were the two components we took up separately because they were more important and they were identified based on the economic constraints. By the way, I must tell you, here, sorry, I missed out on that. 50% of this funding came from MMR HCS. So this was a component. I'll just show you historic images. What you see in the middle is how it was restored. On the left is as it was found after the demolition of the fort walls. Some nice sketches. It was covered over by tar paint. Very difficult to remove. Somebody must have thought it wise to cover it so that it does not leak. But that's the most incorrect thing to do scientifically. And so it was removed, came back to its original. And this is how it came back to original, including the flooring. So the flooring was co cobbles. The original flooring we encountered and it was opened up. The other gate in the other curtain wall. They've given these names for the Portuguese. They give the names, the, the Navy gives the names by numbers. I've not mentioned it here. And this is how the sundial was restored. It's a big story. We can have a full session on these, each of these. This was something of a great find, the Bellard Bandar Gatehouse, which was uh, adapted as a naval museum. Interestingly, the the naval the, the, the Bellard Bandar Gatehouse actually is a part and parcel of the designed framed structure of the Bellard Estate. It was never a part of the naval dockyard. During the Chinese War, this was completely covered up with a very high wall and one could not see the monument at all. It was the interest of the Naval Dockyard authorities themselves who identified it. And when I was doing, when we were working on the Bombay Castle, they identified this, took us there and asked me as to what is this monument all about? And we found out that it was the gateway to the Eastern Promenade which today is defunct and is, is a part and parcel of the naval dockyard and not accessible, but accessible today because of the museum. The thought that it was an Eastern, it was a gateway to the Eastern waterfront, a lot of history was unearthed. And the first thing that struck us as conservators uh, to gain from cultural significance and the historical chronology was that if it was a gateway, then people must have entered from the road level. And if people would have entered from the road level, then it must have a passageway in cobbles. And therefore, when we looked at the setting of the place, we realized that inside, once the wall was, and you can see the wall here in this picture, that the plinth of the monument had risen by almost three feet and it hid the foundation completely. And therefore, we did our work very carefully so that we are able to unearth the original level. So this is the interesting setting within the Bellard Estate. You can see the Bellard is Bandar Gatehouse in the old mall station here. In the picture, you can see the setting, such a significant setting in the Bellard Estate. This was the first set of initial report. And this is how it is set, as you can see, vis-a-vis -vis the memorial, the war memorial in the background. 
and we took a decision to, we had to take a decision of uh, providing a boundary at the backside because of the security issues of the naval dockyard. We could not leave it open because they said that it has a front wall which is so high and therefore it is protected. And so we thought that we just move this wall from the front to the back and let it surround it so that the monument becomes visible and accessible to people at large and people of the city. And they very readily embraced that thought and the project became quite a success. As you can see a certain before and after. This is the overall image in the setting. This was the old wall. This is what happened. We brought in the typology of the grill here because we had to make it transparent. And so we brought in the design language of Bellard Estate entirely. And we brought it here. We borrowed it from the Indira Gate, which is identical. And so the Indira Gate typology came here. It was designed and hoisted up. And so it had this little new modern altar because it was housing a museum. So this was a museum, very nice, interesting artifacts. In fact, this, the, the museum was designed, uh, curated uh, by, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name, um, the Sharda Dvivedi, our biggest historian and contributor of so many books on Mumbai history. And this is how it had a grand gala opening. One more asset inside, this is a rigging shop. This is where most of the ships must have been rigged in the dockyard. And this was one more asset that they identified as important. It was in a completely bad state, a neglected state of disrepair, as you can see in this image on the right. You can see what it was and what it became. We got the drawings, we got narrations from people, vocal narrations, and we were able to link up everything and set it up all over again. Here also the ground has risen, as you can see from the surrounding ground on the right-hand side, bottom picture, we had to take steps down. And so we had to resort to French drain here again, because otherwise, how would rainwater be drained? And so it was devoted to Wadia master builders and a very elaborate process, design process was undertaken. We were very happy to collaborate here in the curating and the furniture design and display design for this museum. So it was a kind of a total undertaking. Undertaking. One of my favorite projects, Juma Masjid, uh, a very, very important, sorry. A significant asset. It is set on water. Somehow the connectivity of environmental sustainability has cropped up in all the projects that I have discussed so far. But this, far, this one by far is the most unique. You can say, see in the, these are the original pictures on the bottom picture on the left, you can see water body. And you can see that the main building of the mosque is hoisted and built over the water body a very unique setting. So a technical brief had to be prepared, submitted to the Heritage Committee. All the rituals of identification of cultural significance had to be undergone. So the entire chronological order of the history, its changes and the state of repair, all that was undertaken while uh, identifying the cultural significance. And all this was uh, documented very properly. A massive intervention, massive scope-wise, massive time-wise. 
it took us almost three and a half years to restore this asset as phase one only. The other phase we have just completed. So you can see the date of 2005, the second phase we have completed just six months back. We introduced stained glass, we introduced, this is a change that I'm talking about. So there are scriptures within the religion, religious scriptures of the sect to this, to which this belongs. And we read through it because the clients were very keen that the asset is enhanced, not just repaired for the benefit of the users. And therefore we undertook a very, very detailed uh, line of justification for making certain changes and making or adding a few elements. One of them is the stained glass, the various processes, new lighting, a very elaborate lighting system. I must stress, looking at these photographs, you must have realized that people like us as practitioners, as a people who profess conservation actions cannot do without this craftsman team. They are of a life cycle. If they are not available, and if we do not treat them as equal, then we do not get a result that we that you see here. So my salute to the craftsmen and to the craftsmanship that is so inherently built up in our country, it is so rich. So that we are able to continue to maintain these uh, assets in, in, in a true sense of continuity. So you can see how the steps come down for Wazoo. And the Wazoo is done directly into this water body besides the different tapped Wazoos uh, around the site because the number of people that come on Fridays, it's a Friday mosque, is more than 10,000 at one go. And so now they've started to distribute the hours of the Friday namaz in three sessions. And they see to it that nothing filters outside on the road. Very, very congenial trustees. At no point of time, our team who are not from the same religion, religious sect ever feel that we are outsiders. We were welcomed. I was welcomed as a lady. I was never asked to wear a burqa or even a head cover because I had mentioned that it would be very uncomfortable to wear a head cover while working and they very readily absorbed all of us because there were many ladies in my team. Before and after, as you can see, the processes, we have to get involved ourselves. And so you can see myself climbing up the scaffold. We do it very regularly. And the inscriptions of uh, the stained glass in calligraphy. We had to call people for calligraphy experts from Tonk in Jaipur. And that is the finished product, which is there on the poster. And the last project that I will share with all of you is called the Ismail building. It's become famous as the Zara building. It sits right there, plonked at the cross section of Fort Precinct. It has got a beautiful flora fountain as its setting. It would have etched the fort wall in its earlier altar, in its earlier architecture. And so it has, the fort area has many layers. This I would say is a second layer, second layer after the demolition of the fort wall. We got the dates, the history and so on. We also found a note of the architect of the place, Jamshedji, mystery. And we got this name much later. We got it actually after the restoration was completed. The old files did not mention him. The earlier owners did not want to disclose it, very sadly. And then finally we found 
a name. Very important to understand the regime and the setting and the age in which architects design. And the product is always an answer to that such kind of a setting. So these are identifications, again, identifying cultural significances, building up of the dates and so on. My biggest help in understanding the architecture of the original building was, I'll come to that when I show you the picture. And the restoration was done based on that great help that we received of an older picture. Here it is. So this is the lone picture that uh, we received from our great historian, Rajan Jaikar. And it is based on this picture that the first uh, understanding of the building became clear. The crown that you see on the top is something that I had shown here. It was, it didn't show it like this. It was completely covered completely covered up. It was only this little picture that made us realize that there's something there on the top. And so it was unearthed. So many stories that one can tell from these restorations. It was in a very bad state, a very unique structure. We were talking about sustainability in taking conservation action decisions. This decisions was one of the toughest for my team. If we go by the book, the least amount of intervention is what is recommended, which, what, which even I have recommended. This structure being of the date of 1906 still had a, a kind of a unique construction typology. The walls were load bearing. The internal structure was entirely ours. All the columns, slabs and beams were in RCC. It was very badly handled over a period of years with multi-tenancy. And multi-tenancy tenants think that because they do not own the building, they, they have no, no connection with it and they can vandalize it as and when they like it. And because of that, a lot of fabric was lost. You can see how the balconies were enclosed, the amount of uh, vegetation growth and so on. The conservation proposal thus highlighted after taking a detailed structural reports that if we do not demolish the internal core, then we will never get a second chance of reviving the external skin. And it's not a skin, it's a load bearing wall. It can take that a kind of a intervention only once. If the internal core fails again, the external core will never be able to kind of restructure itself because it would intervene physically into the body of the structure. And therefore we took a decision of, and also because the structure was in RCC and in a very, very bad state. If you restore RCC, it will have a lease of life of never more than 10 years. If any structural engineer tells or informs anybody here that it will have a lease of life of next 50 years, I would say it's a fallacy. It cannot do that for a building which is so old. And therefore we took this decision that we will restructure and the heritage committee understood the context and gave us permission. So you can see how this was completely like a blob, completely covered up. It has a history of why it was done. I will not go into it now, but you can see that the restoration was done. The person sitting there on the left is my craftsman. He's a contractor, but I call him a craftsman. I had to tell him only once that, listen, I've got a photograph. It is showing something else, be careful. And so he assigned himself, he would stay there when it was being dis. It was, it was being repaired, Do it, did it very carefully. And there it was. Luckily it was done in line and therefore we could recover the original structure and finish it. This is a staircase which is not accessible to anybody. 
but it still stands there. Of course, it is not original. It was timber in original. I'm very sad that we lost it. It was in a bad state. And in, in, at some point of time, I own up that uh, wisdom did not prevail with the entire team. But I saw to it that we saw to it with a great pain that we reinstate the cast iron grills. It had a very nice flooring which we could only recover and store. And so we reused it wherever we can. So we have restored it here in the staircase, which is again not accessible to all. Some drawings, uh, signage details, it was insisted upon by the Heritage Committee. And then we gave them a manual for maintenance and upkeep. I, but I think it is not adhered to at all. It is very favorable that the person who has done the restoration continues in the maintenance regime because technically that is a person who knows exactly how the restoration was done. But in most cases, that does not happen. Sadly, it is not happening even here. So all the restorations that you might see the skeleton coming up, I am not in charge. So some before and after, this was a magical, but I'm still very proud of using the most scientific, the most minimum interventions. We did not use jet sprays to clean. We used poultices only. We did not allow my craftsmen, which I'm calling the contractor, to ever use a jet spray because I was very afraid of the skin. It was a very, very fragile load bearing wall. And this is a team who partook in the process. I end my session here and I stress on the collaborative process once again. Thank you very much for the patient listening.